Bless you, Tom. Thank you, Neil. Morning, everyone. Trust you're having a great day. God is so good. God is good. Been very good to me. Uh, I've just been thinking this week about that verse in, in uh, James, which says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. You know, we endure trials, but God gives us a crown. And also in Revelations, he's talking to the, one of the churches, he says, if you endure through the trials, I'll give you the crown of life. And I've been thinking this, how is it that God gives us a crown of life when Jesus won the crown? What do we have to overcome? He's already won the victory for us. He's won everything. He's won the crown. He's won the victor's crown. We sing that song again and again and again. But he gives us the crown of life. So I was thinking about this. What is it that we overcome, Lord? What do we endure? What, are, what is our journey on this? When you've already won everything. And God just began to show to me the, the different aspects of this, that he has won the victor's crown. But they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. You know, we're born, I hope we're all born one day, back in the day. I saw this little baby yesterday, brand new baby. And it was so lovely to see this little baby. And his dad was Irish, I think. I said, what's his name? His name's Finbar. Finbar. I said, that's a strange name. I've never heard that before. I've got a new grandson. His name's Finley. So we had Finley and Finbar. <laughs> Where do they get these names? I don't know. Anyway, so it was a cute little thing, but he wasn't too happy and he had his little bottom lip stuck out. You know, he's only probably a week old. And it was just so cute, this little baby. But you know, when they're five years old and they stick their little lip out, they probably get some discipline. But if you get a 50-year-old and he sticks his lip out, it's just tragic. <laughs> you know, and so... so uh, there, there are some things that we have to overcome in our soul. We are body, soul and spirit. When we're born, we're fully emotionally developed. We've got all our emotions and the little babies can show it. But then we start to develop our mind and we start to think. And we go from concrete thinking in about teenage years, we, we go from concrete to abstract thinking. You know, in, in when they're young, you know, yes is yes and no means no. But when they start to think a little bit, you say, no, they go, why? And they start to think, just uh, try to reason things out a bit. But the Bible says that the carnal mind, the natural mind, is at enemies with the realm of the spirit. To be naturally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we've got our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. But we're called to be led by the Spirit and to be spirit people. And our spirit man is made alive when we become born again and we get saved and we come in connection with God. And we've got to learn to bring our soul into subjection to our spirit. We've got to let our spirit man be the senior partner of our life on this journey. And so our soul has learnt to lead. We get led by our emotions when we're young. But then we become intellectual, and depending how smart you are and how well trained you are, you know, we start to think that our mind is the ruler. But the Bible says that it's at enemies with God. We've got to bring our mind into the place where we submit to the Word of God and to what God says. You know, even Jesus ran into this problem when he went to his own hometown. He went to his own hometown where he was raised and he was doing miracles all over the place but he came to his own hometown and the people in the town says isn't this the carpenter's son isn't he the one you know who was raised by the carpenter you know we know his brothers and sisters and they became intellectually offended with him and there was if you get enough people that are intellectually offended with the truth of the word of God it shuts down the power of God. And it says even Jesus couldn't do many mighty things there because so many people were intellectually offended. Our minds are very, very important. They're the interface between this world and the realm of the spirit. We've got to renew our minds. 
to be able to hear God's voice. In Ephesians 4, to 24, it says, put off the old nature, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, which is created according to God, in righteousness and true holiness. It says the same thing in Romans 12, chapter 2. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if we want to be able to hear God, we've got to bring our minds into the place where we can allow the word of God to flow through it rather than thinking we know better. Are you hearing me today? We've got to bring our souls on this journey. We try and figure things out. I used to always try and figure things out. God, what's happening here? How's this going? What's going? Why, why, why? Asking all these questions. But... It didn't do me any benefit. We've got to learn to bring our souls into subjection. But it doesn't mean that we, we, we push our souls down. It means we've got to walk with God in this thing. We're saved by believing in Jesus, but we're transformed by believing like Jesus. We've got to believe like he does. We've got to believe what God says. We've got to get this word in. We've got to get it into here. And this is not the way to do it. <laughs> We've got to get it into our thinking. <laughs> We've got to get the word in. It's amazing, you know. I'm just thinking, I've had two words now that my hair is going to grow back. Two prophetic words. I think, God, I haven't even asked for that. Why, why is, you know, I used, to have, I used to have two runways. One went that way and one went that way. But I'm telling you, it's getting narrower. I've only got one now. <laughs> I don't understand that. I don't need to understand that. God can do what he wants to do. All I have to do is agree with him and come into agreement and get my mind dropped trying to figure everything out and just agree and allow God to do what he wants to do. And let God move by the power of his spirit. Bring my mind into subjection, saying, you're not the boss here, mind. You're not the senior partner. God is the senior partner. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness means we are right standing before God. But peace is something that affects our soul. We need peace in our soul. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. When I come and pray, sometimes, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get perplexed. Is that big word? Stuff going on in my world, my family, things going on. And, and you know, it affects me emotionally. It affects my thinking. It wakes me up in the middle of the night. So I want to come regularly into the presence of God and allow his peace to come around about my soul and bring peace to my inner world. Are you hearing me? Because he's the Prince of Peace. When that peace of God comes, I'm having an encounter with God, with his peace, and I just let his peace wash over me, and I stay in there till all my thoughts just settle and my emotions just settle, and I can come back into that place of peace. And then I can begin to walk in joy. You can't have joy if you've got no peace. They, walk, they work in that order. And so the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy is also something that works out through my soul through my emotions and I have joy and I can walk in the liberty that he brings me. See, he has won the victor's crown but I've got to be a co-worker with him and he is the senior partner. It's not just me running around doing what I want. Is this making sense today? In Matthew chapter 8 verse 22, Jesus said, let's go to the other side of the lake to his disciples. They got in the boat and he went to sleep. But then a squall came down and they were in the boat and mind you, some of these guys were fishermen. They were used to being in a boat and they were afraid of being drowned. That must have been a fairly decent sort of storm for fishermen to say, we're going to drown. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. How can you be asleep in the middle of a storm in a boat? I don't know if you've ever been in a boat when it's in a storm. You know, some people would go a bit green and last thing you could do is sleep. Jesus was asleep. They went to Jesus and shook him and said, wake up, Jesus, wake up. 
don't you care that we're going to drown? And she said, oh, you have little faith. I think, man, that's harsh. We're going to drown. And he's saying, you have little faith. And he stood up and rebuked the wind and the waves. And peace came. You can only have victory over the storm that you have peace in. We've got to have peace in our soul, in our inner life, to be able to speak peace to the outer life. Jesus was the Prince of Peace. He wasn't worried. He knew what was going to happen, so he went to sleep. He knew he had a purpose to fulfil and nothing could change that, so he was at peace. Sometimes we get worried about so much. We worry about this, we worry about that, we worry how's it all going to work out, what's going to happen, you know, how are we going to pay the bills, what are we going to do, and we lose our peace. But if we're going to have victory, we've got to find the peace of walking with God. Then we can begin to speak to our external world and speak peace to it. Are you hearing this? Our faith is in his victory and in his identity. We get our identity from Christ. In him I live and move and have my being. He is the total victor. And when I find my identity in that place, I can walk in his victory. It's not my victory. I, I don't have to have the victory. He's already won the victory, so I'm just walking in him. I don't have to try and push and strive. I stay in peace because he is the Prince of Peace. I'm in him, he's in me, his word's in me. I come out of this place of peace now and I, then I, from that place I can speak. It totally shifts it from the place of me trying to make it happen. I'm supposed to repent and turn away from dead works. It says in Hebrews 6 verse 1, the, the seven principles of the doctrine of Christ. Repent from dead works and have faith in God. Is this making sense today? You're hearing me. It's about taking our soul on the journey, our mind, our will and our emotions. It's about taking our soul. See, our spirits, I used to hear from preachers that we've got to, our spirit man has got to take the authority and don't worry about the soul. But we've got to take our soul on the journey with us. It's no mistake. I do not believe it's a mistake that we have a, a man here who brings the presence and power of God and a lady here who has a ministry to our soul. We need the balance who brings health and healing to our emotions and, and to walk in this place. Are you hearing this? See, this is how we've got to obtain the victory so we can walk with the crown of life. If we leave our souls behind and our emotions are in a mess and we're just standing and doing all this spiritual stuff, then, then we still fail. We're still a mess. We've got to find the peace in walking with Christ, walking with his wholeness, walking with his liberty, the peace and joy that influences our soul. We need to think like God thinks. You know, the enemy can come and he can say, they don't like you. They fill us full of rejection. We can feel all rejected. But God says, I love you and I'm well pleased with you because I'm in Christ. That's what he said to Jesus. That's what he says to me. The enemy can come and say, say nothing will work out well for you. All the problems you've had this week, nothing's going to work out. It's always going to be a problem. But God says, all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. See, we can get so messed up in our thinking that we can't walk into the liberty that God has got for us. We get intellectually messed up. We've got to bring this thing back to believe what God says. I was asked this week if I wanted to join a lottery syndicate. And I drive a bus at the school, Suncoast School, and... Um, they asked if I wanted to, to join this lottery syndicate. Now, you know, I'm not into gambling. I think it's wrong thinking and uh, false hope. Some people like the idea of getting a lot of money because it means liberty and lifestyle and, and, and buying things. Um, but here's another way to look at it. When I got saved, I won the lottery. 
I won the lottery when Jesus came into my life. Because he says, he's given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. There is no lack in him. He's given me everything I need. It's a different way to look at it. But I've got to own that truth to be able to walk in it. Rather than hoping that, you know, my number might come up. My number came up when I received Christ. I need to develop a godly mindset around finances. There are heaps of scriptures about it. Um, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, uh, uh, at one stage, I had a whole bunch of investment properties and, and was doing all sorts of stuff financially and, and I lost it all. And I was so full of sorrow for the loss. And you know, the thing that set me free was when I repented from giving myself to the spirit of mammon. And just all the sorrow left. And the heavens opened up again and just enjoy the presence of God again rather than whinging about what I lost. Are you hearing this? See, to walk in peace, you've got to get your mind on the right track. So often we look so naturally at just the stuff. You know, a, a, a rich mindset says, I want to get a lot of money and have a lot of things so I can have a selfish lifestyle and do lots of things that I like. A poor mindset says, I'm entitled and I'm looking for somebody to give me stuff so that I can buy things and do things that I want. But a godly mindset says, I'm looking for who I can invest in, that I can leave a legacy and give a title to. It's a very different way of thinking. And it's not about how much I have on the outside. It's about what sort of life I have in my inner life. Are you hearing me today? See, the first two are about taking, but the last one is about serving. Philippians 2 says, have this mind in you which was also in Christ, thinking not only on your own things, but also on the things of others. Having a servant mindset to serve others and to give to others and to bless others. That if you bless others, the blessings come back. The blessing of Abraham is, I'll bless you so you can bless others. It's a different mindset. It's a kingdom mindset. That, that's the way to have a, a, a godly approach to it. And if we walk in that, it's amazing how peace comes and joy comes and liberty comes when we get our thinking right. We've got to bring our minds into subjection to the truths of the kingdom of God. And then our soul can come with us and take our, take our peace and our joy. And when circumstances happen, We've got to come out of that place of victory in our inner life. I do not want my inner life to be determined and dictated by my external circumstances. I want my inner life to dictate to my external circumstances. And this is how we walk in the victory and obtain the crown of life by walking with God but bringing our soul on the journey, not just about spiritual authority and power, but having our souls walk with us in subjection to the truths of the word of God. Is this making sense today? Look, we can have so many things happen to us. We are complex people. Complex, perplex, perspex. We've got all sorts of things going on. You know, we can have relationships. I, it's... Life just, there's all sorts of things that happen to us. But the word of God has got so much truth. Jesus has won the victor's crown for every aspect for us. And as we come with him and as we walk with him and as we bring him into all those circumstances and situations like Nancy teaches, to bring health to our soul, then, it, then we can walk in the liberty that is God and have the joy and contentment One of the first verses I was supposed to bring, James chapter 1 verse 2, one of the most perplexing verses. <laughs> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I mean, how does that work? 
because we do have all sorts of various trials, all sorts of stuff going on. You know, the, more, the longer I've been speaking with people and pastoring and talking to people, I find out that everybody's got a story of some shape or form. Everybody's got something going on. Everybody. When we fall into all sorts of different trials that are going on, count it joy. But let, let the trial have its perfect work. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be patient and, and endure, wanting nothing. God is very interested in our motives. And when you come to the place when you are content and you don't want anything, it's an amazing place. If you want for nothing, there's no lack. There's liberty. And the liberty comes out of your inner place of walking with God. We, he gives us the crown of life. Humility is not about putting yourself down, it's about lifting others up. Oh, I wanted to tell this story about finance. Just one last story. You, you okay with me? So, I've, I've had a lot of trials around finance. And uh, back when I was pastoring, you know, I, I believe in God to, there wasn't enough, you know, income in the church to pay for all my needs. So, I believe God for work and I do this and I've done all sorts of things and and uh, we had all these bills come in at once, you know, that like they like to do. And I had, I think it was an electricity bill and a telephone bill and a couple of other things, I can't remember. And they added up to about $900. Now, this is a while ago, so that was a lot of money back then. It was like a month's income, you know. So I needed $900 and I thought, Lord, if you provide me with $900, that won't be enough because I tied that, then I'll only have 810 So I need $990. God, I need $1,000 because I want to be faithful with my tithe because how can I believe you for income if I'm not being faithful with my income? So I'm believing for $1,000. So I put myself to prayer. God, give me $1,000. I call it in. I ask you for it. I believe you for it. And you know, I was going on for like this for a week at all my prayer time, believing for this money. And then God spoke to me. He says, it's coming. And I'm going, thank you, Jesus. This money is coming. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, I'm so excited. God has spoken to me. This money's coming. I don't know how it's going to come. You might give me work. It might come in the mail. Somebody might give me. I have no idea how this money's coming, but I thank you for it. Another week went past. No money. So I'm going to pray. God, I thank you for this thousand dollars you spoke to me I know you did I thank you I receive it I receive it I receive it I receive it I'd like to receive it now I receive it <laughs> another week went past <laughs> thank you father I'm holding on to your promise you said I am believing with all that I have another week went past Four weeks went past and I'm sweating on this. And I'm praying, God, I believe you. You said, and my mind and my emotions are getting all tangled up. I've got to pay these bills. You said that it's coming. I get a phone call from a friend. He lived about 100 kilometres away. Uh, hey, Tom, uh, God has spoken to me about giving you some money. Can I come over? I said, yes, please. <laughs> so he came over and we sat down, had a nice chat, a cup of coffee. He gave me an envelope. I opened it up and here were 10 nice, crisp $100 bills, $1,000. I said to him, when did God speak to you? He said, about a month ago. <laughs> Now, I was very grateful to God for getting this money, but I just wanted to smack him. Because <laughs> the truth was, I still had struggle in my soul. My soul still needed some work to come into the place of total peace. God, you've spoken, so I'm not going to worry. 
And that's the challenge. With our souls, our minds kick in. And we try and figure it out. Is this making sense? See, we've got to walk with God and bring our souls and say, stop whinging soul. Stop complaining. Walk with God. You know, and even 3 John verse 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. We've got to bring our soul into a place where our soul, our mind, our will and our emotions can prosper. But it doesn't happen by the external circumstances. The, the external gets changed when our inner life changes. Healthy thinking will give us healthy emotions. Forgiveness and grace are essential to walking with God. We're co-workers with him. And, and even in heaven, the Bible says in Revelations chapter 4, that there were 24 elders, which to me says people that are mature and have been authorised by God, and they're the, they're the elders in heaven. The 24 elders in heaven that had their crowns, that when the Lamb of God came in, they knelt down before God Almighty. They knelt down before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. They knelt down before Jesus Christ and they took off their crowns and they threw them before him and says, all glory and honour to you, Lord. Everything that was created is for your good pleasure. And we give you all the praise and honour and glory. We've been crowned with the crown of life, but it really belongs to him. It's his crown. It's his glory. It's his place. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word today, that you've called us to walk into the crown of life, into the place of victory. But yet, Lord, our souls need to play catch up and father i thank you that it's by the power of your spirit that you help us to bring revelation to reveal to us and to show us these truths help us lord help us help us help us i really feel today several times we've had this thing about being perplexed about struggling in our emotions and in and with the situations that are around about us so i'd like to uh, make a, a an altar call if you identify with some of the things that I've been speaking about and are struggling with that inner world to are just believed to be able to put faith over you, come into agreement with you for the grace and the power of God to overcome. So if that's you, please come. Please come.